<clears throat> okay, so this is going to be the final teaching uh, as we kind of approach our thinking and the way we, uh, kind of the processes that we have. And so I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll we'll get started. Lord Jesus, uh, as, as we go through your scriptures today, and as we've had uh, fellowship, I just want to think about Shannon, who's getting a heart transplant. That's amazing, Lord, that that's even a possibility. Uh, we pray that you would be with the surgeons and uh, with Shannon himself, that, Lord, this would be something that would kind of open his eyes to his great need for you and that you would receive the salvation that you offer. Amen. Um, I pray that... Uh, he be with his wife, and uh, that she would do the same, Lord. Um, we thank you that Morgan gets to be here with us, and uh, that, that Cassie has built this strong relationship with them, and, and that maybe even Morgan would just hear the gospel in a life-giving way today, and, and you would save her. Thank you that we get to gather. Um, Father, this message, as we, as we look into these scriptures, uh, we, we need you and your spirit to reveal these things to us. We need you to show us uh, our own thinking. So much of the time, Lord, we're, we're blind to our own blindness. And uh, we are prone to being deceived. And so I just pray that you would help us. Uh, and that we would help each other. That we would um, not be a people who are proud, but a people who are humble. And uh, who have great fellowship uh, in your name. And we, yeah, it's in your name we pray. Amen. So... This pat this, today is sort of a, a transition piece. I, uh, I'm pretty sure next week we're going to be praying, and then after that, I'm going to do some teachings specifically on spiritual warfare and uh, kind of revealing some of the schemes of the devil. Um, but but we're kind of transitioning a little bit away from the way we think and more of of kind of understanding who our enemy is. And so this is this is a really good teaching, I think, for that. I've entitled it, Seeing the Unseen Battle. Uh, the, the thing that happens so often in our lives is that the culture that we live in in our lives, the default setting is just to operate off of what we can see. We operate off of... <coughs> Um, you know, our normal kind of day-to-day -day routines, and we lose sight of the reality that there is a whole nother, and, and I don't know if you want to call it a whole nother dimension, uh, a spiritual war world that exists just like the world exists that we live in. That as part of this world, there is this physical uh, dimension in which we all live and operate, and, that, and in this same world, there is a spiritual dimension that works and operates. And, and so much of the time, we, because it's not, it, it's not clearly seen or clearly discerned, uh, we lose sight of that. And uh, I think about in the battle for our thinking and in the battle for our minds, uh, part of the reason why we uh, fail to have really good success in transforming our minds and, and uh, being freed from spiritual strongholds is that we, we don't really, we only see half of the battle. There's this whole unseen spiritual world that is operating around us, that, that we can't see, but we can see the effects of it. Uh, like 
if you, if I think about it in terms of like if we were out at the lake and uh, around the corner, may, maybe it's a really placid evening and the lake is really still and there's no water um, and somebody around the corner throws a giant rock in the water. Uh, we can't see the rock go in the water, but we can see the effects of it in the water as, as it waves out. And so much of the time, that's the way it's operating in our lives. There's this spiritual battle that's going on, and we, we're wrestling with the effects of the battle, but we're not addressing the, the source of it. We're not understanding the enemy. We're, not, we're, we're kind of living oblivious that there is a spiritual world that is animating these things that we're dealing with and that we're wrestling with. Uh, and I think that this battle is especially difficult when we put our hand to the plow in discipling people uh, and reaching the lost. And, and I think that if we're going to have some success there, we're going to have to uh, do a better job of addressing the source and the core issues. So... Uh, what, I, what I've got is I've got a couple passages of Scripture that just reveal sort of this unseen reality. Uh, this first one is from the life of Elijah. Elisha. And uh, the Israel was in this war against uh, Aram. And whenever Aram would set out to go to battle... The prophet Elisha, God would reveal to him where they were going to go and what they were going to do. And uh, the king of Aram was just like losing all these battles. And so he went to basically his, his cabinet and he said, uh, hey, somebody here is telling the Israelites our plans and they're figuring out what's going on. Who's the traitor? And they're like, well, none of us are. It's Elijah. Right? God, he's got this inside scoop with God, and whenever you make plans, God reveals them to him, and then he reveals them to Israel. And so the king of Aaron was like, well, where's he at? Let's go get him. Right? He is the key to us defeating Israel. And so he sends uh, a whole troop out to capture Elijah, and Elijah's uh, Servant is overcome with fear at the sight of this great enemy just coming after him, this one man and his servant. And so this is the passage. It's from 2 Kings chapter 6. The king of Aram, he says, Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. And when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elijah. Don't be afraid, Elijah told him. For there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Okay, so in this moment, uh, God opens up the eyes of the young servant. And it's, what's interesting is Elisha doesn't see this. Just the servant. Elisha had believed it. And it is shown to the servant. And when he opened up his eyes, there was this physical reality of all this army coming up against him. And then when the spiritual veil was lifted, the servant seen this angelic army that was between them and the and then, as the story plays out, Elisha just starts praying, hey, blind these guys, confuse these guys, send them here. And, and then they end up trapping these guys and not killing them, treating them as guests 
It's a really interesting story. Uh, but but I, I, I put this up here because you and I have to understand in, in our thinking that there is another reality going on all around us all the time. Okay? It's a spiritual reality where things operate differently than they do here. Time and space don't affect that reality like it affects us. Um, but it is going on. I think about in the movie The Lord of the Rings. Has anybody ever seen The Lord of the Rings? The first one, right? Okay. Ah, you guys. You're the only one who likes it. You gotta go and use it. It's like the purge. When, when, when the, the, the main character slides on this magical ring, his eyes get open to everything that's just kind of a spiritual world that's going on around him. And and that that is happening. Whether we see it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not. Now, think about this. If you're trying to gain ground in a battle and your enemy is surrounding you and working against you, and you don't even acknowledge their existence, what's your chance of success? Almost zero, right? Uh, and, and I see this happening in so many uh, Christian families and Christian lives. Uh, God, God saved you, and he's going to deliver you ultimately. But your own life is not a story of success and overcoming strongholds and freedom and a passion for the Lord because uh, there's this spiritual war that's going on around us all the time and we're oblivious to it. Okay? So this is another passage. This is... Uh, on the on kind of the good side of it, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. This is a story from the life of Jesus. It says, uh, six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. So these are men that lived hundred and more than a thousand years before this event takes place. Okay? And all of a sudden, this spiritual realm and these people who formerly existed like we exist here in space and time, they appear. All right? So there's this veil sort of removed from these guys' eyes so they can actually see these men, all right? Uh, Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Just like Peter, he just can't, he's got, I gotta do something, right? Can't just exist and, and take this in i got to do something. Uh, but even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. And the disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. And then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And then they looked up. Moses and Elijah were gone. And they saw only Jesus. So again, it's not just it's not just this uh, angelic reality in this spiritual realm. Uh, there are angels, there are demons, there are these forces at work, but there are also uh, the people who lived and have died before. And these two people specifically died in faith that God would save them, and and uh, this is. Great encouragement to us, right? If we're ever questioning what, you know, is the resurrection real or is this other dimension real or uh, how does afterlife things operate? While we don't know a lot of the details about it, we understand 
You know, Moses and Elijah lived hundreds of years apart from each other. And there was at some level, some kind of fellowship. And they were brought to this point where they got to talk with Jesus while he was active in ministry. And Peter and James and John see him. So there is this whole other dimension. And here's the thing. Is it wasn't just going on in the time of Elijah, and it wasn't just going on in the time of Christ. It is going on right now. Elijah and Moses are alive and well. Okay, you just can't see them. Okay, uh, Jesus uh, was buried, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven. Uh, he is just as real. Okay, and and so we have to. We have to begin to, in our thinking, allow that truth to uh, penetrate at a deeper level uh, than it has before. Allow the truth of that to shape our thinking um, maybe more than it has before. And then we move, you know, ultimately to this passage in 1 Peter where he says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world yes, Lord. <laughs> is going through the same kinds of suffering that you are. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, if you're looking for, if you're going to go out and you're going to look for, and, and I know that this sounds absurd, but we have to kind of start here. Uh, you're never going to go around and see Satan uh, prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That is going on in the spiritual realm that you and I can't see. Okay? And, and um, ultimately, I think the nature of this devour is typically different than what we expect. I think on one level, when Satan is devouring someone, he is keeping them from salvation in Jesus Christ by any means possible, whether it's great or whether it's minuscule. He doesn't care as long as they don't come to salvation in Christ. Uh, at another level, there are Christians who live their whole lives as, uh, as if they're just a part of this world system. Uh, they just, I, I was reading in this book this last week, Christopher and I were, about um, people going through life, and they're just trying to find their place in this world. And really, what's happening is the world has found a place in them. And they've become like enamored with this world. It's just about the paycheck. It's just about the work. It's just about getting through the day. It's just about the car, it, it, whatever it is. And, and we're, we're just focused on the physical. In that way, their ministry effectiveness is void. They're not discipling people. They're not growing. Uh, they're not gaining ground for Christ. And by and large, they are useless in this spiritual war. Okay? Satan devoured them. Right? Uh, and, and so we, we, need to, we need to be aware that these are the things that are going on. So that brings us to our passage that we're going to spend a little bit of time at our tables on. This is from Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, this is about the spiritual war that we're all in. This is Paul writing to a church in uh, he's written about a lot of really amazing things uh, to this church in Ephesus. And towards the end of this letter, this is, this is his words to them. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Paul, if you, if you look at that, Paul is telling us, telling the Ephesians, is revealing that the things that are going on in this battle uh, are not against flesh and blood. The problem that I have with a person is not a flesh and blood problem. It's a spiritual problem. And that there are spiritual forces called principalities and powers that are animating and directing and informing this battle and this war. Okay? And, and so Paul's like, you got to be aware of this. you got to put on the armor of God. And he says, this is what it is. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we have these six uh, items, if you want to use that language. But uh, Paul, I, I don't think I don't think we should focus so much on uh, breastplate or shoes or sword. I think there may be some as we interpret these passages, uh, as we try to figure out the armor of God. I think there's, that should inform us a, a little bit, and we should consider what items are associated. But if you look at it, at the how the items are described this way, right? You have truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So you have these six items that make up what Paul calls the armor of God, that God has provided for us in this spiritual war that we're in that's not against flesh and blood, that's against principalities and powers in heavenly places. So what I want us to do is at our tables, I want us to answer these three questions. And you can, you can color outside these lines a little bit, but I think it's important uh, for, for us to kind of stay anchored to a few things here. One is, uh, what does this have to do with Jesus? Okay, because uh, our lives are lived in Christ Jesus. He is everything to us. And so how does this connect with Jesus? How would you teach someone to put it on? Paul says, be sure to put on the full armor of God. So if someone comes, you know, the, the boss guys come to Paulo and say, Paulo, I believe what you're teaching us from Ephesians 6 is true. How do I put this on? All right, Dad, how do I put this on? Okay? And then what are the consequences if we choose not to put it on? Okay? I want us to consider those three questions. But here's what we're going to do. There are six items and three tables. So, uh, Tara, at your table, I want you to handle truth and righteousness. So what do those two things have to do with Jesus? How would we tell somebody to put those things on? And what are the consequences if they don't? All right, uh, David, you guys are going to look at gospel readiness, okay, and faith. All right, so gospel readiness and faith. And then Lisa and Mike, you're going to look at salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Okay? And then what we're going to do is, is at your table, you're going to work through those, and then each table is going to kind of inform the other two tables of what does it have to do with Jesus, how do you put it on, and what are the consequences if you don't. Anybody got any questions? Okay. Ready? Go. I'll put that back up in just a second. I'm going to pause this. All right. So there's Christopher and I have been reading the screw tape letters and uh, want to kind of give a little bit of preface to what we were about to read. So the screw tape letters is a fictional book written by C.S. Lewis, but it's a book as if C.S. Lewis had discerned spiritual warfare as it, as it pertained to demons and how they affect and influence and what they're trying to accomplish in the lives of the lost and in the lives of Christians. Okay? And so, but it's written as if it's one demon writing to his nephew, another demon, and they call themselves tempters. Uh, the enemy would be God. Uh, the father below is Satan. And so it's a little bit backwards from the way we would typically think. But C.S. Lewis was a guy that had incredible insight. Okay? And there's a handful, I think Christopher would be 30 chapters in, and there's a handful of these that are like, oh my goodness, he just nailed it. Okay? If, you, if you will learn, if you will kind of take what's being writ, written here, and you'll consider it as part of this spiritual war in this unseen world, it's like, oh my goodness. And there have been several times where I've been like, oh dude, I've been duped. I find, my, I find that he's writing about me. And, and this, is, uh, this is one of those chapters. So, screw tape, writing to a lesser demon. Uh, about a, a patient. The patients are just people that they're trying to deceive, okay? He says, you will find um, that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. So he's saying after you've worked on somebody and they have, you've kind of got them where you want them, you know, they're oblivious to the fact that you're working their life, pretty soon you'll, you'll find that anything is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book, which he really likes to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. This is written 40 years ago. Okay? You can make him waste his time not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations with those he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods. You can keep him up late at night, not roistering, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. All the healthy and outgoing activities which we want him to avoid can be inhibited and nothing given in return, so that at least he may say, as one of my own patients said on his arrival down here, I now see that I spent most of my life doing neither what I ought nor what I liked. You will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, 
without signpost. Your affectionate uncle screwed him. Okay. I find this to be particularly sharp edge because most of the time in Christian circles, we're doing things that aren't gross sin. It's not gross sin to play, play cards and just enjoy the day-to-day -day things of life and enjoy a good movie with my kids, right? Um, it's not, but none of it is serving for what I'm here to do, and that is to make disciples and win people to Christ. And I find that we often get sidetracked, not with gross sin, not with murder and adultery and gross fornication, although those things do happen. Most of the time, we're just, we're, our attention is just taken a little bit off to the side. And literally years go by, year after year after year, and we have accomplished very little of what we could have if we would have been aware, I'm in a war. The war is for my mind and my thinking and my time and my actions are going to follow my mind. And I have, uh, like Paul told Timothy, uh, enlisted men don't get caught up in civilian affairs. So, uh, you're in a war. Don't live as a civilian. That's the, that's the instruction. Now, we still do the things that civilians do, but we do them as if we're in war. When I go to meet the guy for concrete, the meeting is about whether I can hire him for concrete or not, but there is a war that's going on for that man's soul. And I had better make sure that I am, I have got that as more important than me getting the bit that I need. Okay? And I've got to there's a battle for that person's thinking. Um, I've got to talk about the things that are the truth. This is the thing that is true. And let's talk about something that is true. Let's talk about salvation. Let's talk about the gospel. Righteousness. Um, these things that are part of the armor in which we put on. Okay? There is a war. Don't live in this alone. At war time. All right? Um, anybody have any questions or comments about seeing the unseen world, uh, the war that we're in, any of the armor, or the Thing from the screw tape letters. Do you know that this country man is, is a non-believer? I, if I were, if I were, I, he's not living like a believer. I can say that. If he, if he is a believer, he's, he's living in gross sin. So, do you know that? I do. Anybody else? Questions or comments? Shirley? The scripture that comes to my mind um, when you were talking about the unseen world is the one that's in Hebrews 12. I just found it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So what is it? Hebrews 12, 1. Thank you. And it goes on to say in verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right. I also think about <clears throat> Jesus when he was calling disciples uh, it wasn't it wasn't gross sin that kept people from following Jesus. It was uh, a wife, a herd of oxen, and a harvest in the field. 
right? And and or the and one so, of somebody's dead relative. Well, that that was another one, and the the thing that John Piper said about it is it's not it so often it's the gifts of God that hinder us when we follow Him. That's why he says things like like I have got to be more important than husband or wife or children or mother family name. Jesus has got to be more important. We're going to follow him. And, um, and yeah. So, anybody else? Okay. Uh, I, want to, I want to just finish up with one bit of a, a word of challenge on our thinking. We've been going through the Gospel of John on Wednesday nights. And this last Wednesday was particularly good. It's the story in John chapter 2 where Jesus shows up at the temple and it's during the Passover and there are people exchanging money in the temple and they're selling oxen and doves and Jesus sits down and he makes a, a whip of cords and he drives all of the animals out of the temple. He turns over the tables and he pours out the coins of the money changers. And the passage reads that the disciples remembered that it said, zeal for your house will consume you. That in that story, Jerusalem was the capital city of Israel. And Israel is a religious nation. They exist for the purpose of religion. Inside their capital city is their temple, the center of their religion. Passover is, if not the central holiday, it is one of the central holidays and Jesus goes into the capital city, into the center of religious worship, and he drives all these people out because of what was going on in the temple of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, Paul says that you and I are God's house, and we are God's temple. And that the zeal that Jesus has for the temple wasn't over brick and mortar. And the zeal that he had for the temple there in that story is just a foreshadowing of the zeal that he has for this temple. Okay? And what Jesus did was incredibly radical. He was one man that walked into a temple where hundreds of people were coming. Thousands of, millions of people were in the city. Thousands of people were coming for worship, and there were hundreds of people in the courtyards where all this stuff was going on. And Jesus, Son of God, makes a whip of cords, and he drives them I believe that at certain times there has to be radical response when we've gotten way off track. And I believe in God's timing that uh, He, at this time, as we're dealing with our thinking, as we're trying to be aware of spiritual warfare, strongholds, I believe that God is calling us to address some things radically. I've been searching this out in my own life, in my own heart, and I believe he's calling all of us to do the same thing. Okay? And so I would just ask you at this time to consider that God still has zeal for his temple, 
that you are that temple. I would like for you to consider, God, what are the practices in my life, in my thinking, that you would drive out? And I want us to just take some time to consider that and respond appropriately with Jesus. I believe you flip these tables over in my own life. I believe you would drive this way of thinking out in my life. I believe you would drive this practice that I have in my life far from me. And, uh, and so I want to invite you to do that. Okay? So I'm going to pray for us and pray through some of those things and and as you feel led, and you start to warm or build those things together, I'd like for you to, uh, in your own spirit, uh, take care of those things. If you need to have some accountability with those things, grab somebody after church or make a phone call today and say, this is the radical thing that I need to deal with. I think Jesus wants to drive this out of my life. I'm being devoured uh, in my life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, I think about you being zealous for us and that you would drive out things, practices, strongholds, ways of thinking. You would drive them out. You would change them, Lord. But not to hinder us or to injure us. But because we're being injured. Because our lives are being devoured. Whether it's just on one end of us just living unintentionally and just giving away our time and our imagination for nothing to the other end, Lord, where we're involved in gross sin of one kind or another. We're giving our lives over to unrighteousness. Um, we're yielding to every temptation that comes our way around money or around uh, uh, you know, sexual things or um, you know, idolatry around materialism. Whatever it might be, Lord, that you would come in and you would, you would drive these things out from us. If there is anything in us, Lord, now, that you would do that and just let your spirit in and do that. We, we invite you to come in and to do that work. We trust you that what you will give us is better than what we're doing. And Lord, I, I thank you that in you uh, we can have victory in this war, that you are the truth, that you are our righteousness, you are our salvation. You have given us the word as a sword and the Holy Spirit to reveal and, and split open the lies and, and expose them in ourselves and in the world around us. Father, I just pray that we would be a people who are given over to your spirit, who are yielded our whole lives unto you. And that you would renew us, Lord, in our call, uh, in um, our ministries. We have a few weeks of what is like summer left, and we need to be planning, uh, kind of getting back on our ministry horses and being trained and reaching others. And so we just
just invite invite you to come and guide us in all of that. Lord, I pray that as we go and we do the things that civilians do, uh, we would know uh, how to uh, war. The war for the mind, uh, the thinking, and the lives and the souls of the people that we'll interact with. Uh, and let us be salt and light, like you are salt and light, Lord. Uh, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, crew. Well, uh, next week, uh, don't forget we're going camping. You need to know where that's at. Uh, get a hold of Cassie or um, I'm sure I can figure it out. And we're praying next week, and then we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit more into the spiritual warfare and the schemes of the devil for a few weeks after that. So. Have a good one. I got two keys. I got this is a classic. Oh,